It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. And whoo, how's your day going so far? <laughs> We're taking in water, boys. We're starting to list. Mama said there'd be days like this. Every now and again, you, you think you're about to have a snow day. I don't know if anyone in Minnesota knows what a snow day yeah. is. Let me tell you how it works in the rest of the world. You get snow, and the roads stop working, and you stay <laughs> home. I know that doesn't huh. that doesn't make sense up here. <laughs> but back, uh, back in the rest of the world, boy, that's a great thing. But we all Almost out of snow day. Technical difficulties averted. We have got ourselves right as rain. And what better way to kick off the show when you're looking for somebody to get you out of the ditch, back on the road, into fourth gear, than to say it's time for the Mike Evans Hollywood Report. Good morning, Mike. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Glad things are uh, moving right along. Oh, we're, we're, we're just sound as a pound, mate. Sound as a pound. <laughs> The report brought to you by Marcus Theaters. As always, a couple of movies coming out tomorrow that I'll be reviewing. And don't forget, every Tuesday, block it off. It is the special value Tuesday, $6 for any movie and 20% off all concessions. All right. Hell yeah. So uh, some quick TV nuggets. Uh, it's, it's, it's dumb. It's stupid. It's goofy. But I think CBS's new buddy games, especially after a few uh, beers, I think it might be a hit because it's it's funny. Uh, it starts next Thursday. Well, you'll be the judge of it next but, Thursday. Of buddy CBS. games? Is buddy that what you games. said? Buddy games. I like the name. <laughs> Adults playing games. The, the, the kids play at camp, and it, it's, it's really okay. it's funny. It's All funny. right. Uh, the MTV Awards only drew 913,000 viewers. Monday Night Football drew 23 million Ooh. viewers. I'll be honest. That's 900,000 more than I would have expected. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. Look, if you want to see real must-see TV, may I please recommend you check out Heart of Invictus. It's on Netflix. It's on now. Every two years, wounded, injured, and sick veterans from around the world are invited to compete in sporting events. Mm -hmm. The aim is to assist their re recovery, their rehabilitation, their rebuilding their spirits. Uh, the first Invictus Games were in 2014. They are created by and they are still run by Prince Harry, Heart of Invictus, Netflix, five episodes, four stars. Wow, fair. So Harry's got one good thing going for him. Yeah, he does. Absolutely. Uh, you know what? Entertainment and sports, they sort of go together. I got some sports stuff. First of all, Minnesota getting six tonight. What do you think? Oh, it's a it's a guarantee. I'll go ahead and call my shot right now. We're going into Philly, and we're getting our asses kicked. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, sports shorts. So uh, years ago when the uh, performance-enhancing drug scandal broke, I, I said uh, I would be surprised if Alex Rodriguez was involved. Okay. Well, it took nine years for my hunch to be confirmed, but yesterday ESPN confirmed Alex Rodriguez was the rat that was ratting out players. A dick. How uh, about that? I mean, uh, you know what I've always called him? Not a rod, but a uh, rod. Uh, yeah. A rod. <laughs> yeah. He's just a rod. Yeah. I can't. I, I couldn't stand that dude the first time I ever saw him interviewed. I was like, there is not a Smug. genuine ounce in that dude's oh, DNA. <laughs> you and I are on the same page. Man. I told him that way about him the first time. Uh, every time I see him, uh, same thing. Yeah. Uh, but I believe, I'd be interested to see what you think of this. I believe the biggest baseball cheater in 104 years, since the 1919 Chicago Black Sox scandal, mm -hmm. is Sammy Sosa. Uh, Sammy Sosa was in that home run thing with Mark McGuire. Yeah. Uh, not only did Sammy take as much or maybe more PEDs than anybody else, but some of his home runs were hit with bats that broke when he hit the home run. Oh, and yeah. He discovered were corked. Oh, no, yeah. He was, he, was, he was corking his bats and himself. So, <laughs> Don't cork yourself, Sammy. <laughs> how many home runs did he hit in his lifetime with cork bats that didn't break? I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. What, what does he care? That's no, terrible. Yeah, he's cashing in. And what you know what? And blame the owners because that strike is the reason that everybody. The strike, which by the way was called on this day in 1994, the reason that they turned their back on steroids because they destroyed the sport. And then they're like, "Ah, eh, people are buying tickets. Who cares?" And juice balls. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, a little scoop, scoop. 
I hear that at the next NFL owners owners meeting, the NFL, the Players Association, will demand that the owners that within two years all stadiums must have real grass, no more artificial turf. Yeah, it won't happen. But I tell you what, free age. Uh, the, the the one thing the players can do is any you know free agents can all basically just stop looking at teams with turf. That's the main thing. If if you know if the Jets can't get actual free agents anymore, eventually they're going to have to start thinking about it. Yeah. I'd be interested to see how that plays out because grass can grow indoors with right. these retractable stadiums. Come on. Yeah, of course. Uh, some odds and ends. Ozzy Osbourne, who I do really, really like, uh, almost died following that quad bike accident in 2003. Ozzy mm-hmm. had a really bad fall at home four years ago. He's had dozens of surgeries, and now I'm hearing Ozzy has some new health concern. Don't know what it is, but when I find out, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, Ariana Grande has finally admitted that she's had hundreds, if not thousands, of Botox punctures over the past five years. She started having them when she was 24 years old. Oh, jeez. 24 years old, she's getting Botox every other day. What the hell is that? Um, that's an issue. Is a function. Is. Yeah, that's a problem. Ego, party of one, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to end up with another list. I did a lot of research yesterday. The five celebrities with the ugliest feet. (laughs) Okay, hold on. Number five, Kate Moss. Number four, Jennifer Aniston. Number three, Julianne Moore. Number two, Steven Tyler. And number one, Oprah. Really? Uh, And I've seen pictures of all of them and... So um, you know what? I, I've seen Steven Tyler's feet in in person, right there, and, and, uh, and? yeah, yeah, it, it's it's an odd, it's an odd. He's got some. He's got a. It's awful. Yeah. 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 I need to describe it, Jennifer. A personal honorable mention. Okay. Uh, to Paris Hilton, just because she has size twelve feet flippers, there. You know what? Like <laughs> well, yeah, size yeah, twelve, yeah, really? Feet, feet that big, you got you got to get an honorable mention on that. I mean, okay, so a, a, a lady's twelve is what a men's ten? Is that correct, or is that just like an old wives' ten? I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. but wow. you get a beautiful woman and nice long legs, and then you go, where are those skis on the end of your legs? Great day in the morning. I don't know. Mm. Okay, I what do you? Hey, Mike, what today. are you walking around in? What size shoe do you wear? <laughs> uh, I wear a ten. Okay. How about you? Uh, I, I am depending on the brand. It's a thirteen or a fourteen. Are you kidding? You... No. How big are your hands? <laughs> big enough, brother. Have a great day. Talk Skip to you later. tomorrow. See ya. See you later. It's all about that ring finger, boys. As long as it's uh, you know, as long as the no. index finger, then the rest of the the rest of the things are in proportion to. The so ring finger tell. is naked right now, though. Sure Mister. is. Oh. That's mm. right. I haven't taken advantage of that. Hang on, I'm missing. I'm missing a pretty good game over here, Coach. Yeah. So Jennifer Aniston has ugly feet. All right. Apparently so. Right. I mean, I, I'm just fascinated by. It. I mean, I, I will literally uh, whatever Mike brings to the table. I'm yeah. happy to have. But mm-hmm. but there are times when I just think, what the hell is he talking about? Well, look who. Yeah. Celebrities' I mean, ugly feet. But I have Mike seen Stephen Tyler's five, feet. Six and he wears a size ten. <laughs> Talk about flippers. My brother Dave was a uh, he. He was wearing a size eleven when he was. Was eleven. He was wow, now he's six, big. like six now. But but he he grew like it, like the feet went ahead of the height, and then then the ears came, and then the buck teeth. I mean, he had a rough run. Did it all leveled off? He's doing great, but and has been for years. But but at the age of eleven, he wore a size eleven. And I remember like wow. even at like I so I'm seven, and I'm like I don't think that's how that's supposed to go. <laughs> yeah, he had a he had some moments there. You know what? Let's look back. This man is a creative genius. This gift that Steve has, it goes beyond just sports and music history. You understand? So, what happened? Uh, I, as I just mentioned to Mike Evans, on this day in 1994, the owners in baseball voted 26-2 to two in favor of ending the season. The strike had already been going on for 34 days. The result, no World Series for the first time since 1904. The Montreal Expos were running away with the NL East. They were the absolute best team in baseball that year. 
Uh, let's see. Ken Griffey Jr. had 40 home runs in early August when the strike hit. There was real concern or, I mean, excitement that he might break Maris's record. Uh, Tony Gwynn was chasing a 400 season. There were a lot of things that went sideways with that strike. And as I mentioned, when they came back and baseball was saved in 95, that had a lot to do trying to get the fans back, which is why everybody, owners, players, managers, agents, even the media ignored the fact that everyone took time off in that strike to put on 15 pounds of muscle mass. Wasn't that a lot more entertaining? Sure was. Yeah, who cares? Just knock the ball out of the park, guys. <laughs> Run around the bases. What's that, 8, uh, eight o'clock interview this morning with the author oh, of Mr. Jimmy? Well, the, right. the director. It's a film called Mr. Jimmy. Okay, it's a, a it's a It's a guy. Well, you, you, you won't believe this story. It's a Japanese guitarist who literally is known as Mr. Jimmy. He has spent his life trying to be Jimmy Page. And there's an amazing documentary out, and we're talking with the guy that made that film. It's pretty fascinating. That's at 8. All right, and then the Adam Sandler tickets at 7.30 with a game show. Yeah, a little Alexa Theater. Adam Sandler, November 12th at Target Center. That's pretty damn cool. All right, at 7 o'clock, what do you guys want to talk about? The Vikings getting their ass kicked tonight and some of that stuff, or should we get into the Toy Hall of Fame stuff? Oh, I, I yeah, Toy Hall of Fame, is a that's, a that's a barn burner every year. I always look forward to the list. Hang tight. Mother of mercy, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> it's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Thursday, September the 14th. Man, we got a lot going on today on mm-hmm. the show. We have, uh, we, in an hour from now, we're going to speak to a man who directed an amazing documentary called Mr. Jimmy about a Japanese musician who spends his entire life, well, being Jimmy Page, of all things. Uh, it's, it's crazier than it even sounds. We're going to speak with this guy in an hour. It's a fascinating story about a fascinating dude. Uh, in 30 minutes, we're going to have a contest. We're going to be giving away tickets. Uh, 8.30, Sam Ekstrom's going to call us to uh, let us know exactly how the Vikings are going to get pounded <laughs> into the turf tonight in Philadelphia. <laughs> Lots going on. Uh, right now, however, um, so Aaron Rodgers has now finally spoken, or he's <laughs> shared a comment after the game. But before I tell you what Aaron said, I did notice that um, uh, one of the hosts on the network, Newsmax, said Aaron Rodgers lost the eye of the tiger once he started uh, experimenting with drugs. He said, hey, it's his fault, right? This yeah. guy said, Aaron Rodgers, uh, he he took ayahuasca, and the quote was, it gives you this, oh, I love you, bro, mentality, and mm-hmm. that's not good. He turned his back on God. That's what the guy said. Uh, who is so, this idiot? Like- I, love, I love you, bro. Is turning your back on God, apparently. I, wow. And he said, he said, ayahuasca tea is a crummy substitute for God. He needs to get back to church. Aaron Rodgers said, I will rise again. Hold on. The Phoenix. Hold on. Aaron Rodgers is a bit of a, the, the, he's the Messiah himself. He's going to rise again. I just I, love all this. I love this quote. Hey, In an Instagram a post. Emmy. <laughs> what, what's that? I said, give uh, Aaron Rodgers a daytime Emmy for Insta- this tweet. Instagram post, he said, oh, the Instagram. night is darkest before the dawn, and I shall rise <laughs> yet again. Uh, well, it, the, the first sentence was, please keep me in your thoughts and prayers. Hey, dude, it's not cancer, all right? You didn't lose a loved one. <laughs> you're, 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 good point. That's you, a good point. Your Achilles popped. You have an yeah. injury, a season-ending yeah. injury. There, we're, there's going to be couple of dozen of those if there hasn't already been uh, several uh, just in the first week alone. So, sure. Yeah, I'm just like, the night is darkest before. What is that, like in England? Was it Thomas Fuller that said that the night is <sighs> darkest before the dawn? You're a freaking NFL quarterback. Pipe yeah, down. A, a, a pretty successful and wealthy one. Yes, um, yeah. yes, no uh, doubt. It's just, it's, I just love the fact that, that we have these, uh, you know, at the end of the day, no one wants to see anybody get injured, especially no. a top-shelf quarterback. I mean, Zeb, to your point, you were like, Aaron Rodgers goes down, the Steelers suck, the Vikings suck. Why did I buy the package? I mean, it affects, <laughs> and it's a domino effect. One injury like yeah. Aaron Rodgers affects the careers of, I mean, every quarterback who's waiting for the phone to ring, they haven't slept since Monday. There are other people we have to take into consideration here. What about, what about those, what about those unemployed quarterbacks right now? Think of them, Aaron. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, it's interesting though for a guy who's going to be 40 next year to basically say, I'm coming back. I mean, he called his shot. I'm going to yeah. get the surgery. I'm doing the rehab, and by God, I'm coming back. And I, you know, to which I say, I have a lot of fun with Aaron Rodgers. The one thing I never say, 
because I don't feel like I have to, is he's an incredible talent. I mean, oh, he's an yeah. all-time great, yep. obviously. First ballot. So, yeah. Uh, with, I mean, hands down. I always poke fun at him, but it's only because he's so great that it's funnier that he's this out there. I love the fact. I love the fact that an NFL quarterback does ayahuasca. He's a great character. And talks about it. Yeah. I, I, I would be – I mean – don't you? Wouldn't you give anything to do acid with Kirk Cousins and try to shake off some of that <laughs> late game jitters? Like, dude, look into yourself. Go, go out, do you know what? Just just take a couple hits, put on some Grateful Dead. I guarantee you, you're you're a playoff winner. That's right exactly after that. what he needs. That's that's what I'm saying. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Slip I mean, some into his. Uh Gatorade, you know. If Aaron Rodgers would simply share the ayahuasca with a, <laughs> with with a certain quarterback <laughs> in the purple and gold, I think we'd all be in better shape. I mean, you could you could probably give Kirk Cousins, um, I don't know, uh, herbal laxative, and he'd think it was ayahuasca. <laughs> Just tell him it is. Oh man, this is trippy. This is wild. I, you know, yeah, of course. Is this, is this Coke Zero? Is this Coke? Zero? This isn't Coke Zero, is it? You <laughs> right. gave me Coke. I, I didn't want to see Aaron Rodgers and the Jets win a Super Bowl, but I did like this story, this NFL season, and I wanted sure. to see what was going to happen if he went out there and laid an egg or got chased around. But you just don't want to see it, you know, three plays in. He oh, it's takes terrible. a seat on the turf. It's absolutely but I, terrible. But I know for a fact that this man, uh, you know, first of all, he was out there going with the hard knocks thing. Oh, we don't want hard knocks. Baloney. You want hard knocks. You yeah. want four cameras in your face at all time. The ego's not going away with the bro. He didn't break his ego. You know, he snapped his Achilles. He's going to be back because he's going to get a whole year of attention now out of this, and they're going to follow, you know, the comeback of Aaron Rodgers. And, yeah, he's uh, – and like I said, he's guaranteed, what, 36 mil, 37 million And, you know, the one thing he knows is if you think I've had – if you think any story about me up till now has been compelling, wait until I come back and and go 13 and 4. Yep. now he's taking a chance. Now he might come back and not have the mobility, and that does change things. But what this is not what any top shelf athlete thinks. What he's thinking is, wait till I come back and win a mm-hmm. Super Bowl for the Jets. Then I'm arguably the greatest. Blah 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 blah. Oh, it's going to be. It's it's the most compelling theater we have. And until then, Steve, if you could please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And prayers. Uh, uh, let's let's pray for uh, let's pray for the Minnesota Vikings defense tonight <laughs> when they go to Philadelphia because uh, oh. not only did they uh, well okay I was excited when they hired Brian Flores yes. and I predicted it would be a much better defense and it as we saw be. Sunday it was way more um, uh, entertaining more Dynamic. fun to watch yeah. Baker Mayfield quarterback for the uh, for the uh, Tampa Bay Bucks who beat us he's he's not only chirping he's like he's like chirping loud about the fact that he figured out their signals. Baker and Mayfield knew what was coming as he stood at the line of scrimmage and he's telling people that. He's yeah. talking about it. Okay, couple thoughts here. Well, you you made the point earlier, Zep. Well, stealing signals in the NFL, this ain't baseball. That's not illegal. That's called doing your job. Right. You're supposed to try to figure out the hand signals and the verbiage that the offense is using or the defense is using, I'm sorry, so that you know what they're doing and what you can expect. As a quarterback especially, that's great. So, Baker Mayfield, all you did was your job, okay? But to talk about it and to be like, (laughs) yeah, here's my question. Well, Baker, what if you hadn't figured that out? You still would have won the game? Like, you're basically saying... Yeah, I'm Baker Mayfield, and I'm oh, I'm still Baker Mayfield because even when I brag, it, it it takes away from my accomplishment. If I win a game because I figured out the defensive signals, I'm not telling anybody. Right, I'm uh, letting you think I'm actually a good quarterback now. <laughs> that was a game of two halves for that offense for the Bucks. I mean, they had a lousy first half. I think less than a, a hundred yards total offense. Yeah. And the second half, even I thought, well, you know, way hey, Baker's got some game from time to time. Well, yeah, he's reading the signals. This is all on Brian Flores, the defensive coordinator, uh, for allowing the signals to be read. And I, I don't <laughs> know if it was a package that they'd used a lot before. Uh, if they had a coach that worked with Flores, I, I don't know exactly how that signal thing goes. But you can read them and you can pick up things like that that's why they cover their mouths sure that's why they mix up the signals uh that's why they're out there yelling jelly omaha and these things don't mean anything or right. do they and then they change them within the game several times so yeah mayfield sh- there's there's no way i think 
that Baker Mayfield has the second half that he does, they win that right. game against the Vikings if he's not reading hand signals. It's been addressed, and we'll see what happens tonight. Yeah. In Philly. Now, the Eagles, do they're banged up. They've got a, a, a handful of starters on the offensive side yeah. not playing. We'll see what happens. A.J. And, Brown, is he playing? He's playing. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's pretty much all you got to know. But how about this? Let's move away from sports, and let's talk about toys. Let's talk <laughs> about games. Yay. Because every year, the National Toy Hall of Fame <laughs> announces the 12 finalists – to be inducted. And this is, I look forward to this every year. I think this is always completely compelling because, A, you find out, wait, that's not already in the National Toy Hall of Fame? How is that possible? And then you also have the thought of, it's just like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're not already in, or why in the hell would they go in? So let's let's go over a few of these. Okay, here's one thing that is not yet in the National Toy Hall of Fame. Battleship. Yeah, how? it's a finalist ah. this year. How is Battleship not in there? You know, because it's battle. incredibly boring. I pl- <laughs> I actually played that last weekend uh. with Augie, and you just sit there with a twelve, <laughs> and it takes like eight hours. Okay, okay, hold on, <laughs> hold on now. You know what else is boring? Gathering the family around a console radio to listen to FDR talk. It was a different time. Uh-huh. It was a different time. Yeah. Battleship as a kid? Come on. Yeah, it became incredibly boring once Atari came out, you know? But there was a moment. Didn't we have a moment? Am we I had kid- a You know moment. what? I'm kidding myself. No, we right. had a... Rock'em, right. Sock'em, Robots. I look back on it very Ooh. fondly, but there was always one with a glass jaw. We had the red one. Was okay. the glass. If you were the blue, you mm-hmm. always won because all you had to do was tap the red one but guess what we sat down like eight times a day when we were at that age and still played Uh rock'em sock'em okay okay all right all all i'm taking this all under advisement okay here's another one not in the toy hall of fame although i can't imagine after this summer this will not go in ken as in barbie barbie is in ken is yet to go in but after the movie barbie yeah i mean i don't know if ken should go in the national toy hall of fame but ryan gosling sure as hell should. Yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean because he's amazing in that movie connect four how about that connect four is that a good one still yeah oh, that's connect four is that good. the checkers in did the lee no. boys enjoy a little game yeah of connect four oh yeah occasion? connect four you bet okay um uh-huh. uh rajon rondo what? point guard in the nba Celtics. Le- legendary Connect Four. Like, he loves that game. What? And he says he's that? never lost. It's, all, it's like a thing about him. Wow. And he has a he car- he travels around with Connect Four. <laughs> he loves to play it. It's just a funny thing to me. That I'm always funny. like, really? Connect Four? Okay, here's another game that's not in the Hall of Fame, which I don't think of this as a toy, but there is a game, a board game version, and you can get it. Bingo. Bingo? Mm. B-I-N-G-O, baby. That's a billion-dollar businessman. American Bingo is descended from a lottery game first played in Italy around 1530. Mm. The game came to be known as Lotto in France and Germany. And then in the 1920s, the American carnival game Bino changed its name to Bingo. And it's uh, it's been, uh, I mean, my mom, uh, uh, St. Imelda Gorman of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, has operated a bingo parlor for 40 years. Nice. She retired a, a while back. That was my first job in Minnesota. She opened a bingo parlor as a fundraising uh, device for our school, and she just brought literally millions of dollars over 40 years have pumped into that school because the people love bingo but it's not in the but the board game bingo you can go buy a game of bingo at target right now Mm -hmm. that's up for uh the the national toy hall of fame and finally here's the last one i'll share with you right now and you might not know this bop it oh i know oh that one where you hit the deal what was the and twist it Uh uh-huh and suck it <laughs> and lick it or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Like, all I know is it was, man, that once a bop it hit the Gorman house, it. it was like if I wasn't the one playing it, I'd be like, turn that off. Mm-hmm. Stop it because you, you just kick yeah. it and twist it and bop it and poke it and punch <laughs> it and twist it and bop it and bop it. And bop it and twist it and poke it and bop it. And I'd be like, oh, my God, stop playing bop it. But then my then the kids would give it to me and I'd be like, and bop it and, and twist it <laughs> and poke it. I love that damn thing. Oh, I, I, Dad would have never allowed something like that in the house. First of all, it made noise. So <laughs> Yeah, right. And I remember my brother, uh, younger brother wanting a set of drums when he was younger. And Dad's like, no way. 
uh, just the sticks. I'm like, what? He's like, I had too much racket. He didn't like things. Okay, the racket. Racket. Your dad and my dad used to chat occasionally, I guess. <laughs> Cut from the Your same Your kid cloth, wants drums, too? I told him no. Me, too. All right, well done. Right. Well, another <laughs> exciting class. Uh, we'll find out what here in a few weeks, who makes it into the Toy Hall of Fame. We we certainly will. Oh, we'll we'll let you know. There's a few more nominees, but honestly, I hadn't even heard of some of them. Um, here's something I have heard of. Hairball. 92 KQRS is rocking the Grove with Hairball this Saturday. Meet up with Woody at Central Park in Maple Grove for live music, beer, and food. Plus, of course, you can grab some KQ swag and other prizes. Rocking the Grove with Hairball this Saturday. Just yesterday, uh, I heard a news story, watched a news story on the television, about Adam Sandler announcing he's going out for a couple of dozen dates for his biggest comedy extravaganza ever. Hasn't done this in a while. And guess what? We've got tickets, and you've got a shot at them right now on the Maple Grove Lock and Safe Talk and Text Line. Callers 9 and 2 at 651-989-ROCK playing Alexa Theater for a chance to win tickets to see Adam Sandler. This is happening Sunday, November 12th at Target Center. Prize provided by Live Nation. Tickets on sale tomorrow at noon. VIP passes for the runner-up to Field of Bands Saturday at the Washington County Fairgrounds. Prize provided by Yellow Ribbon Alliance of Lower St. Croix Valley. 651-989-ROCK. Dial up. Good luck and hang tight. Is that right, Mr. Poopy Pants? <laughs> it's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. Thursday, September the 14th. Whoo! A day that I will always think of uh, when I look at the calendar. September 14th, 20 <laughs> years ago today. 20 years ago today, I got a phone call from a band called Stereophonics. My friends, they're Welsh. They were in San Francisco. I was in L.A. And they go, hey, what's going on, man? Um, can you play a show with us tonight? And I was like, oh. Sure. Yeah, I guess. And I flew to San Francisco listening to songs on a little head, on my little Walkman, uh, you know, and then uh, and got there and had a long sound check. And that night I played the Fillmore for the first time. Oh, awesome. oh cool. And uh, and rocked the house with played, uh, you know, like 18 songs I'd never played before. And it was 20 years ago today. And it feels like five minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. That's neat. Yeah, go figure. Uh, these things happen. Uh, it was, and I filled in for a show. And then after that, they go, well, tomorrow night, actually, back in L.A., can you do that one? I yeah. said, yep. And they were like, cool, then we're set. And then they said, can you play the Sharon Osbourne show? And I said, sure. And then they were like, look, well, could you come to Chicago? And I was like, <laughs> okay. And then 10 months later, the tour ended. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was a lot of fun. Uh, if you can ever spend 10 months on a bus with a bunch of Welsh people, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I'll just say yes. <laughs> by, by the end of it, I actually understood what they were saying after two beers. <laughs> I hope I get the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I, I picked up on, uh, you know, it's funny because there's always the joke about Engl uh, American rockers. You go to England the first time and everyone's just talking like this, don't they? You just can't help it. Uh, but with those guys, I was literally like, eh? Was that bad? Huh? Huh? I had all these little Welshisms that I had. It took about a year to get them all out of my head. It was crazy. Ah, those are good days. You know what's another good day is Sunday, November the 12th at the Target Center. And that's because Adam Sandler will be appearing and performing. And I would imagine uh, being kind of funny. That's what he does. And we would love to give away tickets to see Adam Sandler at the Target Center. So why don't we? We have a game lined up, queued up, ready to go. Candace, do we have a couple of callers ready to play? We have one, and then we need one more. Oh, my gosh. People fall off the phones all the time around here. 651-989-ROCK. Call right now. We lost a caller. We need a second caller. Why wouldn't we? And I see the phone lines lighting up. Come on, let's go. 651-989-ROCK. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, these uh, it's intimidating. I guess these, it must be. These games, you know, and there's a lot on the line. You know, some yeah. people just can't handle it. Okay, know, it's okay. too much. As Candace is lining it up, right? just wow. don't think. Best Adam Sandler movie. What is it? Waterboy. Waterboy? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, 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 no, I'm already changing my mind, but uh, Tony? Maybe uh, Punch Drunk Love or that one when he uh, takes care of the kid. Uh, babe, uh, what's this, something daddy. about a daddy? Yeah. Oh, I, Punch Drunk Love is, I forgot about that. That's uh -huh. really, that's Paul Thomas Anderson. Isn't it? Right. That's really good. Yeah. It's Happy odd Gilmore. but cool. Which is, is Happy Gilmore the one where he, where he gets his ass kicked by Bob Barker? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, then that's that's my choice. Yeah. Don't, don't say any lines. Mr. Deeds. That's oh, favorite. really? That was, yeah, that was kind of a box office flop for him. Oh, I used to yeah. have that, and I would watch it mm -hmm. over and over and wow. over and over. Uh, what, what was the draw? Hey, you know what? Fun mm -hmm. fact. So I, I have my, uh, my, my syndicated show at night, Steve Gorman Rocks, which airs here on KQ and a mm -hmm. bunch of other stations. My co-host, April Rose, she appears in Grown Ups 2. 
What she's does she do? Russian, the Russian ballet teacher. <laughs> There's a scene. Nice. And, uh, yeah, and, and I, I, I've been working with her for years. And then I saw, I was like, hey, you never told me you were in an Adam Sandler movie. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah it was fun. I'm like, what, what do you mean it was fun? It's like, yeah, Shaq, he was such a sweetheart. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's oh. yeah, kind of crazy. All right, we got people ready to play. Let's do it. Candace, who is, con- oh, no, hold on, hold on. Tony, sorry, I can't believe I almost cut you off. Let's hear about today's game. Silly man, absolutely. Well, uh, let me just mention briefly, too, a big happy birthday to our dear friend, Terry Train, today. Oh, yay. Happy birthday, Terry. Happy birthday, Terry. Maybe I'll meet you one day. Yeah, you will. Boy, I hear great things. It's time for me. Yes, we've elevated Alexa to master thespian status. Nice. Uh, she's a very talented performer. What she's going to do is read lines from Adam Sandler movies, and you tell us the line from the movie. What is that from? Today's choices are Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, or The Water Boy. You will I choose from like those it. three. All right, excellent. Alexa Theater, always good, well, at least for us. I don't know about the contestants. Candace, who's caller number one? We have Christian from Buffalo. Christian, good morning. Hello, good morning. You an Adam Sandler fan? I am. All right. Are you ready to play Alexa Theater? I'm ready as I'll ever be. You have answered every question correctly thus far, sir. (laughs) Good luck to you, Tony. All right, partner. Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, or The Water Boy? Here's your first one. You blew it. (laughs) You blew it. Uh, You blew it. Water Boy? He says Water Boy. I am sorry. Oh, yeah. no. Mm, you no. blew it. Right, yeah. it's from Billy Madison. Ah, uh, okay. All right, Christian, back on the horse. Let's go. Captain Insano shows no mercy. One more Can time. You repeat it. Captain Insano shows no mercy. Oh. Ah, uh, Billy Madison. Sorry, that is the water boy. Uh, oh man, I love. I've seen all of these movies multiple times. That one got me too, man. Dang! All right, Next all right, up. we're still in this. Let's mm-hmm. go. It's all in the hips. It's all in the hips. It's all in the oh. hips. Just ease in the tension, baby. <laughs> Definitely happy, Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> that that boy. is yeah. correct. <laughs> I was all gonna right. say that to myself on the course too. <laughs> there we go. All right, you're back on track, Christian. <laughs> all right, three more for you, Mister. Who would you rather bone, Meg Ryan or Jack Nicholson? <laughs> Who would you rather bone, Meg Ryan or Jack Nicholson? Um, Billy Madison. That is Adam right. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> when when Christian just went, um, I really was hoping he'd said Jack Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> if it's super stupid, remember it's Billy Madison, the most right. juvenile of all of his movies. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's great. All right, you're back on track. You're flying, Christian. Let's keep it up. All, all right, right, Christian, two more. Just tap it in. Give it a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a roo. Happy Gilmore. And a boy. There yes, it is. Sir. <laughs> right on. On the precipice of greatness. Here we go. Last one, Christian. Sometimes I feel like an idiot, but I am an idiot, so it kind of works out. Uh, that would be Billy Madison. Mm-hmm. Wow. Nice job. Nice job. Yeah. Starts off 0 for 2 and then hits four in a row out of the park. Well played, sir. All right, four for six. That's uh, that's that's winning numbers around here most days. Hang uh, hang on for a moment, and we'll see what the competition has. Candace, who's caller number two? Barry from Shakopee. But did you say Barry? Barry. Barry. Good morning. Good morning. You a Sandler fan, sir? Oh yeah. Familiar yes, with the films? A little bit. All right, fair enough. I really, they're movies. I, films is a bit much. But. Yeah, for Sandler. <laughs> All right, so so you know what we're doing here. It's Alexa Theater. You're going to tell us which of the three Sandler f- movies these lines are from. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Tony. All right, Bear, again, Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, or The Water Boy. Here's your first one. You could trouble me for a warm glass of Shut the Hell Up. Um, that's, uh, Happy Gilmore. Yes, oh, it boy. is. Yeah, the delivery. Alexa gets I me know. every time. Yeah. Next up. If peeing in your pants is cool, consider me Miles Davis. <laughs> uh, Billy Madison? Yes. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. He's doing well. All right, Bear. You're in big trouble, pal. I eat pieces of <laughs> like you for breakfast. You eat <laughs> for breakfast? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um... <laughs> 
<sighs> Happy Gilmore. I don't know. Yeah, that's oh, right. Oh, oh, yeah. I've used that line. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> that response? Oh, yeah. All right. Here's your next one, Bear. If you're going to stay home today, you can help me shave my armpits. Uh, Billy Madison. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no man. Barry coming in swinging for the fences. Four for four, sir. Keep it up. Next up, Bear. Now that's what I call fine quality H2O. Waterboy. There you go. Waterboy uh-huh. shows up. What's the H2O reference? Bam, I like it. Bam, bam. All right. Let's see if you can go for the clean sweep, brother. The price is wrong, bitch. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, that's Happy Gilmore. Gee, there you go. Sweating and he lobbed that one in. <laughs> wow, that's great. Barry, six for six. You, sir, have yeah. more than earned two tickets to see Adam Sandler Sunday, November 12th at the Target Center. Christian, fine effort, sir. We're not letting you leave empty-handed. VIP passes to the field of bands. Saturday at the Washington County Fairgrounds, and with a Happy Gilmore reference, it only feels appropriate to say, (laughs) (laughs) Right on. Thank you, gentlemen, both of you. Great job. Thank you. I apparently, I'll just come out and say it. I I clearly need to see Billy Madison. I never have. Oh, you haven't? No. Every one of those Billy Madison lines Alexa read made me laugh. Was that? I think that might have been his first post-SNL. Of course, he was canned from SNL, and then... uh... Lauren went out and said, yeah, but you can make movies. That Was that his first one? I feel like it was. Super stupid, juvenile, and perfect. Of course, hmm. you have Norm McDonald's in there. And, oh, yeah. really? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you got Norm on the bench, I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch. Yeah, of no, course. It's, it's worth it. Hey, the 92 KQRS kickback jackpot is at $2,000. Why don't you do this? Meet up with Woody and Bud Light at Lakewood Tavern in Lake Elmo during the first half of tonight's game and sign up for the kickback jackpot. If the first play of the second half is a kickoff return for a touchdown from either team, either Minnesota or Philadelphia, you could win 2000 bucks. And if not, we're going to roll that prize money over to the next game and add another 1000 to the pot. So tonight, get with Woody at the Lakewood Tavern in Lake Elmo during the first half of the game. You might walk out of there with two grand in your pocket. Complete contest rules at 92kqrs.com. Of course, then you can never go back to the Lakewood Tavern. You'd be buying. Everyone oh, would God, know that no. you're yeah. 2000 You know, you're up two grand. Um, at 8 o'clock, we're speaking with Peter Michael Dowd, director and producer of a new Jimmy Page-inspired documentary, Mr. Jimmy. I'll be honest, I glanced at the email yesterday and went, oh, yeah, Jimmy Page thing. This would be cool about Jimmy Page. Oh, oh, oh not exactly. A huge twist. This is a wild story. It's in theaters now. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Thursday, September the 14th. Uh, There is a film that is in theaters now called Mr. Jimmy, and it's about Jimmy Page, sort of. Uh, Jimmy Page, of course, who we just heard, uh, the guitarist, the producer, the 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 genius behind Led Zeppelin, uh, is is who he is, and we all know who he is. However, there's a guy named Mr. Jimmy, a Japanese musician, who has spent decades uh, basically doing his best to become another version of Jimmy Page. The man recreates Zeppelin concerts note for note. He is a tribute act, if you will, but he takes it to a level that's beyond most people in that world. The documentary, Mr. Jimmy, about this Japanese musician, we are now joined by the director, producer, and editor of this film, Peter Michael Dowd. Peter, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, Great, man. And I'm thrilled to speak with you. Uh, You've made this movie about, uh, tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Is it Akio Sakurai? Perfect. Perfect. Akio Sakurai, a Japanese guitarist who is more than a a Jimmy Page fan. He has spent his life trying to basically channel and become Jimmy Page. So I'm curious, before you found out about this gentleman and before you started making this film, what was your relationship with the music of Led Zeppelin? Were you already a big fan? Total obsession and mania. Uh, Yeah, when uh, I was born in 1976, so when Page and Plant reunited at... uh, the Boston Garden in 1995. I think I, that would have made me 19. Oh boy! Proudly, I can 
say I was first in line at Tower Records on Newberry Street, got interviewed by uh, the great WBCN in Boston for sure. being first in line. Um, That's awesome. No, I'm pretty hardcore Maniac fan. I uh, probably had a couple hundred bootlegs um, at the time I met Akio, and I think that was part of the reason why um, everything he did just sort of clicked with me. Like mm-hmm. The first thing I saw of him was a clip labeled Rain Song, 1979 version. So if you're a true Zeppelin nut, 1979, instantly you think Nebworth, and right. I press play on the clip, and he's wearing the exact outfit head-to-toe of Page from 79. And in that right. moment, I was just like, who is this guy, and what is this story? So when you first saw him in person, was that in Tokyo? First time in person, actually, because I immediately, after watching a couple clips of him doing 79, 77, 70, sent an email and his wife says, you must be a lucky guy. He just moved to L.A. to join Led Zepp again. So I thought it was fate. I went to uh, Agora Hills, a uh, real suburban park. They were doing like a, a concert in the town square. Saw him play, was completely blown away. He was doing the black dragon suit and all that. And we sat down for an interview, which lasted about five hours. It's incredible. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so making a doc like this, I mean, this is years of your life, I'm assuming. Was it an easy decision once you spent that first time with him to go ahead and commit to the film? Well, um, eight years, to be precise. Whew. And uh, oh. it, uh, yeah, uh, in some ways uh, turned into a beautiful work of art. In other ways, you might call it a terrible relationship that you can't get out of. Sure. Have a laugh, have a laugh at it. But no, I mean, originally I thought, like, um, this might be two years, three years. Uh, but then things got complicated with him, and, and he left that band, tried to form another. Uh, as you well know, the music industry is tough business. Mm-hmm. He struggled. And I just didn't want the movie to end with him unemployed on a couch in Studio City, California. So sure. I just stuck with him. And then, of course, are the music rights, which were incredibly complicated. So the whole thing, an immense labor of love, eight-year journey, uh, documentaries, if you really, truly just follow the life of a subject, you don't know where it's going to go. But I, I was so honored, and Akio and I, that he trusted me. But we really became deep friends over this eight-year journey together. And, and I don't want to give any uh, spoilers out, but to see how his life has turned out with uh, the music, it's been just absolutely touching for me. Mr. Jimmy is the film. It's in theaters now. Peter Michael Dowd is with us on the KQ Morning Show, the man behind the film. The two greatest tribute acts I've ever seen were both Japanese. I saw a Led Zeppelin tribute act in the late 80s in New York called the called Cinnamon. And, and similarly, the guitarist was out of this world. And also, you know, they would say which tour they were going to play the songs from. The band, It was okay. It wasn't great, but the yeah. guitarist was really good. But then there's also a group called the Parrots, which is a Beatles tribute act in Tokyo that was yeah. there. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're beyond spectacular. And in fact, when my band, the Black Crows, toured with Jimmy Page in 2000, we had them scheduled to be our opening act. The tour was canceled midway through. We were bringing the parrots over from Japan to open for us. What is it about the Japanese musicians? They they do it on a level that American tribute acts just never come close to. Uh, it's something, uh, I mean, perfectionism, craft, attention to detail. Uh, I'm sure you've spent time in Japan. You, mm-hmm. It's just imbued in the culture in every way. I mean, I remember being over there for a few weeks, going to a laundromat, buying a box of soap, and I, I put like, I, I don't know, 100 yen into the box, uh, pull out this box of soap, and it was the most beautifully designed little box of soap I'd ever seen in my life. I took a right. photo of it, and that was like this is a work of art. Everything is done with such beauty and respect to detail. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they, there's something about craft, and they do have this ability to perfect. Like, we might in, in, invent denim. They perfect denim. We invent the car. They perfect the car. Mm-hmm. And going back to what you said about cinnamon, there's a scene in the film where the publisher of a, a sort of bootleg reference uh, magazine called Beatleg talks about, well, one day I got a letter. I had written a lot of articles about a band. That band was Cinnamon. Oh, really? And and how great they were. Yeah, and how, how what a great job they were. And then one day I got a postcard in the mail from Jimmy Sakurai. And it was a detailed memo of all the mistakes that Cinnamon was making in their live <laughs> presentation. <laughs> And at that point, I realized, oh, this Jimmy Sakurai cat is on a different level. Yeah. And that was 
the beginning of that of that editor's introduction to Jimmy Sakurai, but no, he takes it. Uh, no disrespect to Cinnamon. Of course, of course. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything in the film. But can I ask you? Does because uh, we haven't seen it yet? Uh, I, I'm assuming Jimmy Page is well aware of this gentleman, Jimmy Sakurai. Yeah, one of the the best scenes, um, and certainly an event that changed Akio's life forever. I, I I just asked him this the other day. Uh, Jimmy Page in the movie goes to see him play in 2012 in a little live house club in Tokyo with maybe 30 people in it, and sits maybe 18 feet from him. Oh my god! And watches yeah. and watches Akio <laughs> recreate 1973 MSG. Yeah, for three three hours, note for note, and. Jimmy Page was so moved by the detail and the tone of Akio's guitar that afterwards, Jimmy gets up, hugs him. His first thing, almost instinctually, he grabbed Akio's playing hand and kissed it. And then the first words out of his mouth were simply the work. Mm. The work that you put in to play my music, I'm simply blown away. It's incredible. And, and that led to a whole chain of events. Akio feeling emboldened, uh, in, endorsed, or, or somehow given permission, oh, I'm, I'm doing a good job. Akio literally wanted to ask Mr. Page, am I doing a good job? Is this good enough for you? Is this good enough for your music? So humble. And Mr. Page said, of course, this is, you're doing great. And Akio took that and said, wow, maybe I should share this with the rest of the world and move to L.A. And I asked him the other night, you know, if Mr. Page had not come in that night, would you still be in Tokyo? Would you have ever left? He said, oh, I never would have left. I never would have left without that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very, very, very moving. And if Mr. Page hadn't seen Akio face-to-face like that and experienced his playing so close, I, I certainly don't think he would have signed off on so much Led Zeppelin music being performed in the film by Akio. It's just, it's just something special. There's a million tribute bands in the world, but Akio is not that. Akio is like the way Yo-Yo Ma is to Bach, Akio is to Jimmy Page. And you, I mean, the insight you could offer mm-hmm. on Mr. Page um, is just a different breed, different level. Um, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, you know, when you said that the first words he said were the work you put in, the work you put in, I mean, that actually really got me because uh, uh, Jimmy's a very pleasant, very complimentary, super, super sweet guy. But, but if he says the words the work, it, it, I mean – there's a there's a level to him that most people don't have, and he does have an insight into everything about music, but specifically his own music. I mean, I'm just I'm still I'm at a loss for words at what it must have meant to Jimmy to see somebody do it to that level, and for him to give him that praise. Uh, there's nothing. There's no higher praise you could get from a musician. Yeah, pl- please watch the movie. I mean, I got heart palpitations. Yeah. You know, we went back to that club. And to, it was so small, and Page would have been so close to him. And I'm thinking, for 30 years, Akio had been studying, you know, playing uh, the song remains the same live at half speed, quarter speed, rewind, pause, play, rewind, pause, play, you know, just going through it, going through it. And he's in the club watching you, and how do your fingers not freeze up? He played beautifully. And the the embrace, and Mr. Page got off his up on his feet and did a standing ovation after the 26 minute days to confuse. I, I can't underestimate that, that how emotional, how impactful that was for Keo because he truly would have at, at that point in his life, he had a day job. He was what you call a salary man in Japan. Mm-hmm. He worked for electro harmonics in, in uh, Japan, you know, uh, distributing uh, guitar effects pedals and stuff. So he had, he had a day job. He quit his day job at the age of 50 and took a chance to move to California, not even speaking English. Um, wow. But he just loved the music so much, and he felt like as, as long as Mr. Page thinks it's okay, I'm going to try to take this show on the road and share this music with the world. So, Absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, so uh, the MrJimmyMovie.com is a website anybody can go to to find out where it's playing. You can watch the trailer, which I have, and it looks incredible. Uh, man, I, uh, Peter Michael Dowd, uh, thanks so much for calling in today. Can I ask what, what's your next project or what are you working on now? Have you got anything else in the, in the shoot you can share with us? Yeah, I do. It's, uh, not rock and roll, but I have a, there's a, a true story. I'm into true stories and, and characters. So mm-hmm. there's, um, and I'm also into kind of personal things. So there's a, a case that my father worked on in the eighties, a murder case in Boston, and I, I can't go into much detail, but uh, it's an incredibly sad story. 
so uh, not to take your show on a downer. But I am, um, I've been researching that case for about five years and uh, looking to turn that into a, a film. So. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, listen, uh, when you're ready to talk about that, let us know because uh, uh, we'd love to have you back on the show. Mr. Jimmy is in theaters now. Thank you, brother, for calling in. Can't wait to see it. Thank you, Mr. Gorman. Appreciate you. You got it. Hey, um, real quick note. Yeah. Can you guys call me Mr. Gorman from now on? Uh, I was just <laughs> thinking that too. How respectful. Come on. Come on. Let's go, Mr. Gorman. Um, I, I, I mentioned the Parrots, a Beatles tribute band. They mm-hmm. play at a club called Abbey Road in Tokyo. They've done it for years. And um, the the guy who plays John Lennon actually looks a lot like John and then went ahead and was surgically altered to look more like John Lennon. Seriously. That's... And I, I kid you not, this band is incredible. When you close your eyes, yeah. you're like, I'm listening to frickin' Abbey Road. Wow. Right. I, I You know, so I watched the trailer to this movie that we're talking about, Mr. Jimmy, yeah. and I wanted it to end as soon as Jimmy Page hugged him and they took pictures. I'm like, no, 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 don't go to L.A. Don't, 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 don't go <laughs> yeah. to L.A., dude. Yeah. Yeah. You're peaking. This is your crest right here. Don't right. crash against the rocks of L.A. And um, and so I don't know if this movie's going to end up breaking my heart or not. I've got to watch it because when you watch the trailer, you're like, okay, I'm invested now. I've spent sure. three minutes watching this. I've got to see um, how it plays out. But, yeah, it's like you talked about that band Parrot. You wonder, I mean, is it mentally healthy <laughs> to get into a tribute that deeply i i think i think at some point it's mentally healthy to think about leaving it or doing anything mm-hmm. else they just the commitment is yeah. so strong i i just remembered this jimmy told us a story about a japanese collector back in the 90s when page plant went to japan for the first time uh they met the promoter over there uh took them and they met a very very wealthy japanese businessman who had a collection of famous people's gear and he said, Jimmy, I've, I, you might want to see this. I know you haven't seen this guitar in a long time. And he opened a case. It was like backstage at the gig. And and the guy was treating this guitar with such reverence. Like, this is your guitar from wherever. And I paid X amount, $300,000 for it. And Jimmy said, I'd never seen that guitar before in my life. And he looked at the guy and he goes, that's, that's not my guitar. And that's not my autograph on the guitar. Oh. And he said, the guy just fell apart because yeah. you you didn't own this guitar jimmy goes i've never seen it before in my life what did he do played it on stage that night and then signed, signed it, it and gave it back to the guy oh <laughs> class yeah. come on all who way. doesn't love jimmy page all the way um the vikings you know what i hate is predictability i hate it that every uh show that i watched last night about the vikings eagles tonight uh obviously picking the eagles far and away we're all picking the eagles far and away i don't like that uh, because the nfl busts that paradigm all the time is tonight the night are they going to erase the sins of sunday sam ekstrom our vikings insider will join us at 8 30 and we'll get the lowdown hang tight it's the kq morning show 92 kqrs zip tony Candace and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Thursday, September the 14th, or as it will go down in history, the day the Vikings turned it around. Hey. Maybe. Uh, tonight in Philadelphia, Thursday night football, the Minnesota Vikings on the road. We'll all tune in to see... Who, baby? Who knows what we're going to see? But I do know this. The Chiefs and the Chargers are coming to town uh, uh, both over the next three weeks. So this would really be a nice surprise one to pick up. Sam Ekstrom is a host and Vikings insider for the podcast network Locked on Sports Minnesota. You can hear him on the Ron Johnson Show and the Minnesota Football Party and the Vikings podcast after each game. And right now, he is on the phone with us on the KQ Morning Show. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Steve. How are you? Uh, I'm okay, thank you very much. I'm very interested to see this game tonight. We've had a few days to process Sunday's opener, the loss to Tampa Bay. Looking back now, what are the positives? What what was really good? What would, what did the Vikings do right that they can feel good about as they go into Philadelphia? Yeah, I like the question because a lot of people have been all doom and gloom, and I actually walked away, obviously – disheartened because that's a game you want to have. But I did think that there was some good stuff. Um, I thought the, the defensive pressure they applied, particularly early in that game, was really good. The run defense was pretty good throughout. Um, and offensively, you move the ball at will. 
in the first half, you found a way to get Justin Jefferson 150 yards when the Bucks had all off season to plan on how to stop this guy in week one, and they couldn't do it. So that's encouraging as well. Um, obviously, you can nitpick and get into the nitty gritty of why they lost that game, and it probably it comes down to turnovers. They turned it over three times, but mm-hmm. uh, when Kirk Cousins throws for well over 300 yards and Justin Jefferson goes for 150, and your defense allows 20 points, you're going to win that game nine out of 10. Uh, so clean up the turnovers, and things might turn around. Yeah, you know it was a, a tale of two halves for sure. Uh, what 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 do you attribute the lack of movement and the lack of aggressive offensive play calling in the second half to? Well, let's break it down drive by drive. First drive, they get the ball in the third quarter. They go 16 plays and score a touchdown. They tie the game at 17. So that's good. I'll right. take that. Then in the fourth quarter, you have two possessions, both three and out. Mm-hmm. So they only had six plays after that touchdown drive. Um, and both of them started with a failed screen to tight end TJ Hawkinson. The first one went for minus three. The second one went for minus two. And that set back those possessions to second and 13, second and 14. And they couldn't recover. Um, I think they had a third down throw that was overthrown to KJ Osborne. They had a third down to Jordan Addison that was broken up. Uh, and that'll happen when you have second and long. You're probably not going to convert a lot of those series. So you look at just a couple plays that put them behind the chains and kind of, you know, ruin those two drives in the fourth quarter when they needed them. Sam Ekstrom's with us on the KQ Morning Show. How banged up is the Vikings offensive line right now? Yeah, Garrett Bradbury is going to be out tonight. And I think that was expected when you hear that he's got a bad back and he had a bad back last year that cost him five games. Right. That's worrisome. That's that's troublesome. Um, so he's going to miss some time. They think it's going to be a relatively short-term injury, but he wasn't able to turn that around in four days. Can't blame him. Christian Derrissaw is questionable with an ankle. Now, he did come in and play the majority of that game on Sunday with the ankle injury, but you know how ankles work. You, you take the cleats off, and suddenly that thing pops up. And the Vikings didn't really do a true practice this week. They were all about rest and kind of walking through they were very low contact. So he's been off his feet most of the week. I would, my gut says he's going to play. I think he's going to tough it out and play. So you'll have four fifths of your offensive line intact. And then the backup center, Austin Schlotman, who did a nice job in relief of Bradbury on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Sam, the Zep here. Um, you know who's not going to be in low contact? Probably the best defensive line in the NFL, arguably, would be the Philadelphia Eagles. With a healthy Vikings offensive line, uh, this is a lot of pressure up the middle. I mean, you can just count on it. They're going to get pressure up the middle. And the one thing Kirk Cousins, well, a thing that Kirk Cousins doesn't do well is deal with pressure up the middle. He's not a, a quarterback that uh, feels natural getting out of the pocket or a, a quick underhand sidearm release, that kind of thing. He's a big, he's a Johnny Unitas over the top, needs some time, needs some space. I think that's where the game is won or lost right there. What do they do? I mean, it's uh, obviously they're going to game plan, get the ball out in the flats, do some things, some short passes, side routes, that sort of thing. But, I mean, do they have a chance against this Philadelphia Eagles defensive line tonight? Yeah, really good assessment. I I think they're looking at that injury report, and and they see Fletcher Cox is questionable, and they're crossing their fingers to say, all right, let's let's turn that into an inactive, uh, because that would certainly clear up one threat. But then you still got to deal with maybe the rookie of all of week one, Jordan Davis. Mm-hmm. Who, I'm sorry, Jordan, uh, Jalen Carter. They've got Jordan Davis too. But Jalen Carter came out in week one, the rookie first round pick, and he dominated the Patriots. Yeah. So you got to worry about him. You got to worry about Jordan Davis. Uh, that interior is tough. And they have invested in the trenches. They've drafted these guys high in the draft, trying to build up that pass rush. And it is it has paid off for that group. So even without Fletcher Cox, they still got some problems to deal with. And, and yeah, we saw Kirk Cousins get hit nine times against the Bucks. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of C.J. Ham. I think he played like 22 snaps against the Bucks. You're probably going to see that up over 30 because they're going to need to have that protector in there yeah. to make sure that when the rush gets through, you've at least got a speed bump on the way to Kirk Cousins. So I'd expect a lot of heavy personnel, a lot of fullback tonight, and obviously a lot of quick throws. And that, you know, that might mean more Jordan Addison, more Brandon Powell, guys that are, are more kind of the lateral east to west kind of route runners. And uh, it might mean a little less Justin Jefferson if you can't get the ball downfield with those long developing routes. 
Sam Ekstrom's with us on the KQ Morning Show. You just mentioned Jordan Addison. I, I give any rookie, any uh, high uh, sort of uh, 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 high octane and then and then a guy in the spotlight already with a good contract, I give every rookie a little bit of time because it's a lot to adjust to. And I overlook some boneheaded uh, things that a lot of people find themselves in. That said, this is a big game. It's a night game, second game of his career. As Addison's already had a couple of little bumps along the way, what's his headspace? What is it? What is the word coming out of the team in terms of his, uh, you know, his maturity and his understanding of his role and his willingness to do what it takes? All that kind of stuff you look for. Yeah, I mean, he started off training camp about as badly from a, a PR standpoint as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, he'd, you know, he'd been he'd been hurt all of the spring practices, so no one had any opinions of him. No one had seen him do any of the good stuff yet. And then he has the incident with the Lamborghini where he's caught going 140. So it was it was all negative for Jordan Addison going into like August first. And then he started playing, right? And then he started showing what he can do on the field. And that, you know, it does mask a lot of stuff. When you perform, uh, people forget about the other stuff. And then he started saying the right things and seeming a little more comfortable, uh, you know, in front of the cameras. And you start to kind of know the person a little bit more. And by all accounts, he's a, he's a great student of the game. He asks good questions. He's, you know, open to Justin Jefferson and K.J. Osborne kind of being those mentor figures. And, you know, if I'm K.J. Osborne, I'm looking over my shoulder right now because he entered the hmm. season as the second wide receiver, but Jordan Addison outperformed him in the first game. Mm -hmm. And we've seen how fast these things can change when you've got a young receiver who shows, you know, his stuff early. They can pass you pretty fast on the depth chart. So Jordan Addison, right now the arrow is pointing up after it was way down about five weeks ago. Yeah, I like the word fast with Jordan Addison. It was uh... – it was awesome to see him so quickly get behind that secondary and in the slot look out uh, trying to cover this guy, especially in any type of zone coverage. Let's go to the defense. Brian Flores, I like this defense. I like putting six, seven guys on the line of scrimmage, sending four. Who's going to go? They're coming from anywhere. I think it's great for Hunter, who's a down defensive end. The secondary, you know, they've got their hands full. They've got an A.J. Brown and more to defense against tonight, and and you're gambling with this Flores defense a little bit. But I love it. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it was it was certainly a fun watch against the Bucks with all the pressure, all the creative looks. I don't know if you saw this report, but apparently Baker Mayfield figured out their hand yeah, signals yeah. and was was calling out the defensive look um, before the play. And uh, I don't know how much credibility there is to that. I, I guess I believe it. And if so, you're going to have to make some adjustments on that. Yeah. Maybe it explains why uh, the Bucks were so effective on third down later in that game, because they did convert all those big downs when they needed to. And, you know, if you look up and down the defensive roster, there isn't one guy with egg on their face. Like everybody kind of held their own. It was just kind of death by a thousand cuts there in the second half. But I did like the run defense quite a bit. I, I felt like that's been a big weak spot for, for them the last few years. Uh, I like the Caleb Evans, the starting cornerback. For the most part, I liked Byron Murphy. And then the rookie, Ivan Pace, that linebacker, was really, really good. So th there were positives. Got to see more pass rush. I got to see more pressure from Daniil Hunter. Um, you know, th they didn't have Marcus Davenport on Sunday, and they got no nothing from DJ Wanham, nothing from Patrick Jones. Got to have more pass rush. That's my big nitpick from Sunday. All right. Sam Ekstrom with us on the KQ Morning Show. Sam, I'm, I'm a new guy in town, been here less than a year, so let me ask you a real broad general question. The best organizations, they're buttoned down. There's no leagues. Owner, GM, coach, they're all aligned. Are the Vikings one of those uh, organizations right now, in your opinion, or do we have the right people in the right places? Yeah, I think they are. Um, you know, and there hasn't been a lot of turmoil, a lot of controversy with this new regime. You know, mm -hmm. and then this regime has been here about as long as you have, Steve. You know, right, been right. Here <laughs> no, I know. It's, um, a, it's a lot to get your arms around in a hurry. So I'm curious as to, uh, you know, what, how do you grade uh, the culture, the idea of getting everybody together and, and having a ship moving in one direction? Yeah, I, I would say that it's very easy to, to have the boat rowing, you know, with harmony when you go 13 and four the previous year. Yeah, we, yeah. we could see, you know, the first little plug in the boat if they lose tonight, because this would be the first losing streak of the Kevin O'Connell era. He lost four games last year in the regular season, and none of them were consecutive. 
This would be the first consecutive losing streak that he's had, an 0-2 start. We know how people react to that. So now you might start to learn things about, you know, the culture and how it holds up to a little bit of turmoil. When you get some wind in the sails and you get those choppy waters, you have to, to deal with some stuff. But I, I really like what he's implemented so far culturally, and I think that, that stems from the GM, Quasi Dopamenta, as well. Yeah. I think that they are kind of, you know, they're harmonized and there's a lot of um, – camaraderie but sometimes that will crumble quickly under some duress so we're going to find out a lot about this team tonight yeah Yeah. nothing like a week two thursday night stress test against the (laughs) nfc champions nice jumping right in sam it's always a pleasure brother thanks for the call yeah appreciate it thank you see ya Yeehaw. You know, the one thing I didn't ask was a prediction on that score from Sam Extra. Yeah. Dang gummit. Does I, anybody feel like there's a chance here? I, I mean, like there always is. First few weeks of the season, yeah. there's always a chance. I think there is a chance, and uh, I, I think there's a chance they'll cover. <laughs> uh, but I, I think there is a chance. I don't know why I'm uh, going out on that stoop, but I, I think there is a chance. It's just because the NFL is so damn unpredictable and everyone's predicted a loss for the vikings they just it always the, helps to yeah. go against the wave tony is your blood bubbling purple today no you two pollyannas <laughs> oh, <for God's laughs> sakes. there he goes as long as it's entertaining yeah all right all right uh, you know what's entertaining the kq morning show especially when you're hanging out with us and you can do that because we're hitting the road for a long weekend it's kq up north Ladies and gentlemen, BigDeck.com, our friends are bringing us all up to Cragen's Resort on Gull Lake, October 5th through the 8th. There will be a live broadcast of the KQ Morning Show. There will be drinks on a boat cruise. There will be dinners. There will be golf. There will be all kinds of stuff. You really need to jump in. KQ Morning Show up north at Cragen, sponsored by Big Deck and Cragen's on Gold Lake. Go to the website. What's the website? 92kqrs.com. Go find your tickets and join us, won't you? Please do. I went out and I hit some golf balls yesterday, and I was uh, up against the net. All right, so the net was on my right, mm-hmm. and this net must be 100 feet high. I hit every 68 golf balls right over the net. Nice. Way, no, not nice. Way, no, no, way no. Right. That's impressive. Oh, that purpose? consistency yeah. is. Yeah. At one point, some guy's like, do you want to go down to the left side of the range? I'm like, I, you know. There were yeah. guys out on, I don't know what uh, fairway that was, but they got to be, you got to be, it was raining yellow balls out there. That's awesome. Well, the best pass you might see all season didn't happen on the football field. Heck, it wasn't even a football. We have some awesome audio, and we'll tell you what the uh, internet is simply calling the pass today. We'll do that at 9 o'clock. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Thursday, September the 14th. That was the Tubes. She's a beauty. Tube singer Fee Waybill. Always love that name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a guy uh, <laughs> come up to me, a, a music fan. He said, hey, man, I love that track you did with Fee Waybill. And I looked at him and I said, Huh? Because I never played on a Fee Weibo record. No. And he goes, yeah, Sweden, man. That song is amazing. And I said, okay, thanks. And I figured, okay, this guy's high as a kite. And then I remembered it, and I, it got the best of me, my curiosity. And I Googled Fee Weibel, Steve Gorman, Sweden, and I did play on a song. It's not a Fee Weibel song. It's a Jack Cassidy song, the bassist for Jefferson Airplane. He made a solo record in 2003, and I played on a few of the tracks. Unbeknownst to me, Fee Weibel sang one of those songs later after the fact. I just played in a studio with Jack and a guitarist, and we just jammed, and I never even heard the finished product. And it turned out it was a song that Fee Weibel sang. So anyway, me and Fee were uh, me and me and me and Fee were tight. <laughs> yeah. we're close. Hey, can't can't forget Fee. No, no. it's a- like saying I was on a plane with that guy once. <laughs> you know, it's just like okay, if you say so. Yeah, we don't. Uh, it's like people don't know that. We assume when you make a record, it's like going away to you know deer camp with the guys. You know, well, you all get together and you stay in one room and you just you know you share and you mash it yeah. out. No, if it's a band, sure, it's like that. You know, if it's a, but yeah, if you're just, if someone just calls and says, hey, you want to come play on a few Jack Cassidy tracks? It's like, yeah, of course I do. And you go in, you have fun. And then it turned out later. I think, I think it was much later. I don't even know. I, you know what? I, I, I don't know anything about it. All I know is he wasn't there. I never knew he was going to be there. And now we're, we go down in infamy together. Eh, Jack Cassidy's <laughs> a nice guy, though. I'll tell you that. Was Fee ever short for anything? I don't know. 
I don't not, I don't know a thing about the guy. I mean, other than we're tight and we're close and we're friends and we played on a song at the same time. <laughs> not at the same time, but we're on the same song. Um, Guns N' Roses. Let's talk about Guns N' Roses quickly. Because if you're a Guns N' Roses fan, I need you to listen. We are offering you the chance to put your n- hat in the ring to win a VIP trip to see the band. The final tour stops of the 2023 U.S. tour, you could be at one of those. Maybe you want to go to San Diego. Maybe Phoenix. Maybe you want to go to the tour club closer in seattle score a trip for two including airfare two nights hotel premium tickets to the u.s concert date of your choice plus the paradise city vip lounge package including limited edition guns and roses merch access to the vip lounge and more here's how you do it text the national keyword diego d-i-e-g-o to 95819 right now to enter for a chance to win there it is isn't that nice bang bang boom Who's the quarterback in Cleveland right now? Oh, Deshaun Watson. Yeah. Questionable character, by which I mean he's a piece of dung. Mm. That's just me and all of the many dozens of women who accused him of things. But yes. here's here's the thing. There's another there's another guy with an arm in Cleveland the Browns might want to track down. Andrew Butts. <laughs> does he have to be named Andrew Butts? <laughs> of course he does. That's yes. just Cleveland's lot in life, isn't it? You yeah. signed to Sean Watson, and then the best arm in the city is a guy named Butts. Go figure. So tell me about this, Zep. This guy, here's a story from Cleveland. This is... Um, well, it's called, you know, you know, you always have, you have the catch, Dwight, uh, Dwight Clark, San Francisco Niners, the catch, you have the drive, Yeah. you've got, uh, you've got these seminal iconic moments in NFL history that have names. Now we have the pass yeah. or, or if you prefer the, uh, what would you call this? The, 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 the can pass, the pass can. Yeah. Yeah. This guy takes a beer can. So they're out there on that river that runs through Cleveland, whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce. The Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, you got one of these big freighters cruising down there. And I'm, I'm talking about one of these, you know, 100, you know, feet long Look, or more 150 foot freighters. It's probably about, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet looks high. Looks like the, uh, the Eddie Fitzgerald for crying yes, out loud. right. You're just cruising right on down the Cuyahoga. They're out there pre-gaming as you do there in Cleveland. You're along the river. That's the tailgate area right there before you go into the stadium. Uh, from last Sunday's game, and one of the guys on the ship, or one of the guys from the shore yells out to one of the guys standing on the ship, hey, man, you want a beer? And uh, we're just going to let Andrew Butts take it over from there. A friend of mine, there's a ship passing. He yells to the guy on the ship, hey, man, want a beer? And he waves. He's like, yeah, I'd love one, but you can't make that throw. (laughs) Challenge accepted. (laughs) Buddy of mine tosses me a, a garage beer. I wind up and I put a seed right on the guy. <laughs> oh, that's got a shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there is video, and it's worth, we should actually post it on the Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get this up on the Facebook page. It's incredible. It, it really is. He launches it, they say, about 50 to 65 yards, and this thing has some height on it, too. I mean, this thing hits the roof of U.S. Bank Stadium, probably. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but it's impressive nonetheless. And yeah, put it right between the numbers. The guy makes the catch. Yeah, you've got to have the arm to begin with. Yeah. But this throw doesn't happen unless you've already had at least six of those beers to yourself. Yeah. You know, there's no way a guy who's not already copped a buzz is going to make the throw on such a dime. It's amazing. Yeah. They're yeah, already you're, calling you're, it the best pass in Cleveland sports history. It, it really is. It's it's incredible. Bernie Kosar never had a throw <laughs> anything close to that. <laughs> he didn't have this kind of gun that this guy has. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, really, it's, really, really good. A foamy beer, probably, but that's not the point here. That's not what's happening. So l- l- let me tell you something. The amount of things that men on ships in the Cuyahoga have had thrown at them, a beer is the best <laughs> by a long shot. Yeah, that's the that. river that used to catch fire. Oh, really? Remember, that's right. Se- yeah. That was so polluted uh-huh. in the 60s and 70s on more than one occasion, the Cuyahoga would be on fire. Yeah, I can't like, imagine. With yeah, <laughs> hey, in Cleveland might want to might want to rinse that water out with something. With some, <laughs> might want to add some water to that water. Maybe yeah. less fires on the on the river itself would be a good idea. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Freddie Mercury. Ah, uh, 
God, God rest old Freddie Mercury. Uh, the auction of Freddie Mercury's stuff at Sotheby's over the last week, it is over. And boy, did they take in quite a haul. Now, Freddie died in 1991. He left his home in London and everything. He literally left his entire estate to Mary Austin, his very close friend. And after all these years, she's like, yeah, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. Why don't we auction all this stuff off and we'll send the proceeds to the Mercury Phoenix Trust and the Elton John AIDS Foundation? Wonderful uh, charities both. So... Uh, there were things like the piano he wrote Bohemian Rhapsody on. There were things like the crown and cloak he would wear on stage. There were, in fact, 30,000 things up on what? the auction block. 30,000 belongings. I believe. I have, like, I own everything together. If you count my silverware individually, like maybe yeah. 200 things. Uh, there's Well, Freddie was a collector. Yeah. You know, he traveled around. He saw a lot of things. Uh, let's see. The pre-sale estimate. Sotheby's, the highest estimate was we want to bring in, we're thinking 14 to $15 million total, yeah, which is excellent. a lot of cash. Yeah. Uh, they went over $50 million, oh, as it turned man. out. $50 million. The handwritten lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody, just a piece of paper with handwritten lyrics, 1.7 mil. Dang. 1.7 mil. The handwritten lyrics to We Are the Champions... A mere four hundred thousand I mean, dollars. Yeah, these are uh, these are top shelf classics here. I guess we're talking about. Uh, he had a Wurlitzer jukebox from nineteen forty one that still works. That was half a mil. That, would that be jukebox cool. at a at a at a you know at, at a yard sale in uh, St. Paul would go for you know like four hundred dollars. But because it was Freddie's, four hundred thousand dollars. Four hundred. Yeah. Well, that checks and, out. And you'd use it, right? Yeah, of course. No, you plug it in and look at anybody, and you want, it lights up, but you go, no, we're not going to use it. Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. That was Freddie Mercury's, for God's sake. <laughs> no kidding. Well, it was, what was it last week we talked about when the auction got started? This was a long process, 30,000 items to auction off. He had the piano that went for two mil. Was that two mil? It was 2.2, I believe. Yeah, yeah, the piano he wrote Bohemian Rhapsody on. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it, again, money was raised all for, for great causes. Uh, but man, I I, I, mean, I guarantee you, Freddie Mercury. Think about okay, he died in 1991. I I, sp I remember waking up and being told Freddie Mercury is dead, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" Because you know he kept it very under wraps that he was ill. But think about in 1991, if somebody said, "Oh, why? By the way, in 32 years, people are going to be buying all of his memorabilia." I mean, that just didn't make any sense. It didn't seem possible that Queen would still matter in 32 years because in 1991. You go back 30 years, you're still talking about Sinatra and, you know, pre-Beatles. You got Elvis and Chuck Berry, but but those guys were already old. No, you know, the 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 idea that, that music would carry on, you know, with, with classic rock radio and with new generations and with streaming. You know, a 20-year-old today, if technology hadn't advanced so much, wouldn't know the first thing about Queen. Yeah. You well, know what I mean? It, would, it wouldn't be possible. My kids grew up listening to all my favorite bands alongside yeah. all their favorite bands. I read recently that Queen has sold more albums, more music in the last 10 years than they did in the previous 20 years. So I'm sure been the that's 90s true. And the, you know, through 2010. Yeah. And then Bing Bang, um, the biopic obviously had a lot to do with that. But, um, yeah, so they're... Uh, you could argue never been bigger. You know, there is something to be said for that, like that biopic, even more than just people loving the story or, or, or loving the music. There is something to be said for, uh, and it's funny because my kids, we had this exact conversation. They knew those Queen songs. They grew up here and we will rock you in, at ball games and stuff. And they, Bohemian Rhapsody, they knew that already. But then seeing the footage, watching the movie, and then going and looking at the actual footage of Live Aid and other things, you know, both my kids had moments where they were like, "There, there's just not people like that anymore." No, you know, like oh, like Queen live. If you saw Queen in the '70s, they were every bit as bombastic as Led Zeppelin. I mean, it yeah. was rock, man. And Freddie is the, uh, you know, you could make a case the greatest frontman ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and these beautiful melodies and harmony. I mean, they, it's uh, the whole package. What band since has all of that going on in one band? I mean, it's just such a different time where you could be that ambitious musically and still be commercially viable. Um, but it was great when my kids were like watching actual Freddie Mercury footage and they're like, yeah, the guy in Coldplay isn't quite like that. <laughs> and no yeah. knock on the guy in Coldplay. I'm just saying Freddie is like, that's just a whole nother level. And they're just, you just don't see people like that. I mean, like 
I think about Freddie Mercury and I think, well, Bruno Mars is as talented as anybody gets, but it's not rock. He doesn't get rock music the way Freddie did. You know, the, it's I don't know. There's just there's just something about that stuff. And I'm for one glad. As much as the music industry sucked, even when you could make a living at it, it's worse now that the streamers take all the money. But, but at least the music has a chance. I love that Queen is about to sell their catalog for a billion dollars. Yeah, that means that future generations are still going to be hearing Queen, and that's always a good thing. Always a good thing, and it appeals to such a young audience, even more than, like, say, your Led Zeppelins or your Pink Floyds. That yep. we we uh, we matured into that that music a little bit, didn't we? You get a little bit older, you get into those late teen years, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I get Pink Floyd now. Wow, Zeppelin, yeah. but Queen. I mean, you can start loving Queen, and probably would if you're exposed to it at like eight years of age. It immediately resonates. It's so poppy, but it's got and then the showmanship. Yeah, sure. Freddie Mercury. They don't make them like that anymore. No, they certainly don't. Uh, the Maple Grove Lock and Safe Talk and Text Line is always available. Six five one nine eight nine. Rock Candace, who is on the phone right now? We have Rob from No Name Records calling in with little Queen. Rob, memory. hey, good morning, brother. What's happening? What's happening, guys? I thought I'd chime in on the whole uh, Mercury. Uh, I did see them on the game tour with Freddie. Nice. And up until that point, I'm a huge Jagger fan as far as frontman, but I saw Queen that summer, and I saw the cars on their panorama tour that summer. And I saw the cars first, and they were boring as all get out. They Everybody that they, <laughs> every no live no. review of the cars forever said those exact words. <laughs> that sucks. I love their record. Black show, I was disappointed. Then I saw Queen, and I was looking at my buddy the whole show going, this is this is incredible. Mm-hmm. I go, it's a three band, yeah. and he's just blowing the, the roof off. And um, he put right away catapulted to my number two front man. And I think the best thing said about Freddie was McCartney said, there isn't an ego that can hold Freddie's uh, stadium that can hold Freddie's ego. <laughs> <laughs> Damn number, straight. Rob, number one front man. Is he a local? Was he? My number one front man is Jagger, hands down. Freddie, okay. two. And then Rod Stewart, three. All right. I thought there might be a prince in there somewhere. By the way, no name records. That's on Portland near Crosstown. Highly recommend a trip in there. Bought some great appreciate cramps the, albums there. Appreciate the plug. Yeah, right on, appreciate the call, brother. We'll talk to you soon. See ya. Okay. I stumbled in there a few months ago for the first time. I yeah. was like, oh, yeah, no name. I heard about that. Great store. Absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. fantastic. Yep. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Thursday, September the 14th. Good luck, boys. How have fun out there in Philadelphia tonight. Uh, the Vikings, we got to put it all on the line out there, boys. Come on now. We got the Chargers coming into town. Now, that's not a great team. That's not a great organization, but that's a hell of a quarterback, Yeah, Justin Herbert. He terrifies the living daylights out of me. The Panthers come in. Oh, boy, that'll be a nice break because then uh, then, uh, then the Chiefs come to town. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Niners come to yes. town. This schedule is a grinder. So, yeah. uh, you know, tonight a big upset in Philly would be real helpful to turn the ship around before we got some real hard games coming into the uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. It would erase the sins. Yeah, you're right. It would. Uh, week one would be a long, distant memory. That'd be like last season, preseason, something like that. If they could... Get it pulled out tonight. We'll see. They've got uh, they've got their work cut out for them. And talking about the guys in the trenches there on that O line, dig deep. Yep. Uh, you know, you never know. A couple of turnovers, maybe a few lucky bounces, get an early lead, and then the, and then the Eagles are pressing, and then that defense can actually get to Hurts. We shall see what happens. We mentioned earlier in the show the National Toy Hall of Fame has twelve finalists for the class of twenty twenty three. And uh, I at first said, I could, I can't believe Battleship is not already in the National Toy Hall of Fame. And then Tony made the really interesting, very insightful uh, <laughs> uh, a, a point when he looked at me and said, it's boring. Kind of callous, and I was actually, like, yeah, to say yeah. No. yeah, but but at the same time, then we talked about it, and we all agreed, yeah, it actually it really just kind of, huh. Yeah, they've I tried mean, to update it. All they've done is, like, make the pegs a different color. 
That's all you can really do. Re- yeah, they yeah, had that, the lit a... up version for a while that uh-huh. made a bunch there of was noise. That one. Yeah. 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 But I tell you, though, once you get a hit, when you get the hit, oh, then you man. zero in. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this a three, a four? Is it the aircraft carrier? Which direction am I going here? Yeah, I still can see the, the, the box as a kid, G4. They had the words, yeah. the two boys, you sunk my battleship. Uh-huh. That yeah. was the whole thing. Right. Uh, real quick, uh, un- unsolicited recommendation for your viewing pleasure. On Amazon, there's a tremendous show called Patriot. Zepp and I are both big fans. There is a battleship subplot to the season one of Patriot. There's some there's some battleship tournament scenes. Well worth your time. Anyway, but regardless of whether or not you ever take us up on that show or cared about battleship, we'll let you know which toys get in. Over the last few years, I just want to share with you some of the recently inducted toys into the U.S. Toy Hall of Fame. In 2022, the top. Just the simple spinning top. The top. The top. Uh, Ancient folks in Greece and Rome had spinning tops. It took 5,000 years to get into the Hall of Fame. Here's another one. Uh, In 2022, Light Bright. Oh, Light Bright. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember that one time you played with it on Christmas Day? (laughs) Yep. And then never again. Making things light. Pretty great. You know what they didn't mix with Light Bright? Those little uh, Light Brights, the little light-up elements, and shag carpet. No. Oh, yeah, they're gone. You never find it <laughs> yeah. again. Um, in 2021, Risk was inducted. Like the Risk. board game. Oh, yeah. hell yeah, you did. Sure. What What God-fearing, red-blooded American didn't want to go play battle games called uh, Risk and take over the world? It was great. <laughs> yeah, still do. Um, two more I'm going to share with you. It was not until 2013 that the Rubber Ducky was inducted. What? The Rubber Duck mm. is in the Toy Hall of Fame. But here's the all-time greatest one. In 2021... Sand. <laughs> yes. Sand was yeah. inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame. Yeah. What year did it? <laughs> 20, took till 2021. And as far I mean, as I yeah. can tell, sand has been around longer than any other toy. Yeah, I mean, is is it a toy in and of, of itself? It's you know, it's kind of like the playground. You know, it's a a place where you well, play with your toys. But hey, I'm not going to nitpick, and I'm certainly let, not going to argue with the toy well, industry. Well, let, let me share with you what yeah. the Hall of Fame says. Sand may be the most universal toy in the world. From a geologist's perspective, sand is a dry grid of material consisting of small, loose pieces of rock, soil, minerals, and gemstones. But mm-hmm. children recognize sand as a creative vehicle mm-hmm. for play, mm-hmm. suitable for pouring, scooping, mm-hmm. sieving. Forming. Sieving, mm-hmm. sieving, raking, and measuring. Wet sand is even better, ready to construct, shape, and sculpt. Oh, hmm. yeah. Don't, I used to play with sand a lot. Yeah, and don't forget, y- 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 you know, if you want to kick sand in some weakling's face, <laughs> right. well, what's well, more effective? Yeah, what's well, yeah. yeah. something? Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, exactly right. I got beefed Atlas. up, and then I was kicking the sand and getting the gal on the beach. Listen, but you're not playing with the sand. Yeah, you're playing exactly. with a toy that's using sand, but I'm nitpicking. <laughs> The Toy Hall of Fame did put the stick in one year, too. Oh, hell yeah, yeah. they did. Or, I used to have a Zen garden that I was obsessed with. with really? With little stuff in the sand that you could organize. Mm-hmm. Oh, with a little the rake. Sand. Yeah, and then also color sand. Um, that's really big at the fair, too. You can, huh. like, fill up a hollow alien with different colors of sand. I'm in. Do you guys ever have a thing maker? Do you remember you would take, it was called plastic goop, and it would go into these just white hot metal trays. Oh. So dangerous for kids. One was creeple <laughs> yeah. people. Yes. I had creeple people and incredible edibles. And you could was, make little bugs that you could eat. Yeah. And there was another thing. It was like a little oven you would get and you would stick a piece of goo in there and then it would mold into like an action figure or a dinosaur. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they were they were giving us things to plug into walls with electricity uh-huh. in the set. Yeah, right. Unbelievably dangerous. <laughs> it was like uh, yeah, <laughs> that life should be for children. Yeah, exactly. There should be an element of danger. You remove that, you know what you've got? A kid in your basement till they're forty five. It was kind, you know, it's not unlike the cornballer on Arrested Development. Yes. A lot of injuries. <laughs> a lot of injuries. <laughs> <laughs> the corn baller. Come on, man. It's all about the corn baller these days. All right, let's look back. This man is a creative genius. This gift that Steve has, it goes beyond just sports and yeah. music history. You understand? <laughs> so, what happened? It <laughs> doesn't go much beyond, I'm sorry to say. In 1994, after 34 days of baseball players being on strike, the owners of the baseball teams voted 26 to 2 in favor of ending the season. So for the first time since 1904, 90 years, there was no World Series. 
And that really sucked for a lot of people, most specifically the Montreal Expos, who that was the one year they were absolutely <laughs> boat racing everybody. Uh, they would still probably be the Montreal Expos if they'd gotten one World Series championship. Is there a baseball team up in Montreal anymore? Uh, I think they're called the Montreal Leave Us to Our Own Quebec Quoi Fancies. Yeah. <laughs> Dumb Americans. It's, it's a long, it's an acronym, but that's what it stands for. Minor league, single A. Uh, the Ch the Yankees were set to be in the playoffs for the first time since 1981, which at that time was a big deal. Ken Griffey was well on his way to challenging Roger Maris's single season home run record. There were not steroids coursing through his bloodstream, so that would have been pretty exciting. Uh, it was pretty rough. When baseball did reconvene late in 1995, everybody made the decision to just ignore the fact that all all the baseball players look bigger and stronger now than ever. Uh, and, and they did. The media, too. Everybody's complicit with the steroid era. Let's all just get over it. Let's stop. Let's stop. You know, sh let's not go into a case of the vapors every time we talk about how everyone used steroids. They did. Uh, and, and it's just at this point kind of comical that we all pretended they weren't doing it in real time. Yeah. I did not. Raphael Palmero. Oh, the worst. Shame. Shame. Yeah. When you point your finger. Yeah, he pounded the freaking desk in there. In Congress. Right. Yeah. What do you think you are, a congressman? <laughs> Palmero lying, wasn't even that lying good. in the house. What is wrong with you? You're not representing the people. Speaking out of both sides <laughs> of your mouth. That's that's it. That's it. The KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS.